Our next speaker never actually was a real harbor master, but that's how he goes by in social media, and that, becomes from, that comes from a deep-seated desire to become a harbor master when he retires. So please welcome Bob. I hope everyone's enjoying the New York Art Conference. This is my first New York Art Conference. It's an amazing conference. You've all been amazing. The speakers have been amazing. Um, it's glad to be here. Two, one important thing, one not so important thing before we begin. This is about WebR. I have put spiders inside. There's actually one on this one. It's really tiny. Uh, inside the presentation. And I know that arachnophobia is a legit thing. I'm not making fun of it. So if anyone does not do well with spiders, you might want to skip this. Uh, and the second one is um, 20 minutes is not enough time for me to bother with a bio. If you don't know me, this is me online everywhere. Um, I've got a lot of our packages. And if there's time for a bio at the end, I will be glad to talk a little bit more about that. But WebR is more important than I am. So you're here for Into the WebRverse. If this is not your flight, please see this flight attendant up back, and they'll get you to the right one. Uh, I'm going to try to help un you understand how to bring the power of R to the browser and beyond. My two goals for this talk, I mean, there's one overarching goal, which will not happen, which is you all quit your jobs and do WebR after this and just proselytize that. Uh, the more achievable one, I think, is hopefully everyone that is an R person here will poke at WebR and use WebR in some way, shape, or form sometime after this, hopefully within the next year. Uh, so let's map out where we're going to go today with this one. So the first thing we're going to talk about are foundations. Uh, so it's, I like to think of this as uh, WASM 101. How many people know what WebAssembly is or WASM? Cool. How many people have used WASM be, like, them deliberately, like you've created something in WASM? Cool. So you're not going to have to do that with WebR, but I just want to see how technical. So this is good. So we will spend a little bit more, more time on that than I was going to do. Like every great superhero, uh, we're going to talk about the origin story of WebR and also the challenges that were involved in some of that. Uh, so now that you're going to learn about that great power, we're going to learn what you can do with that great power. Uh, and then we're going to maybe step away from our land for a little bit to talk about what you can do with WebR outside of traditional R contexts. Uh, and then we're going to show you how to dive into the WebR verse on your own so you can go out there and start doing a lot of great stuff with it. So WebAssembly, uh, it's also short named WASM. Uh, this is something that was built in 2015. It's been people were poking at it for a while. And the fancy description of it is it's a binary instruction format targeting a stack-based virtual machine that runs in browser or on system. Uh, we'll talk about what that means in more context in a little bit. That fancy thing, it basically just means you like, have a binary blob of something and it runs in kind of a virtual machine. This is WASM. That's, this isn't actually binary code. Obviously, it's ASCII that you can all read. It looks a little bit like assembler code. It's a little bit easier to write, I think, than assembler code. Uh, and you can actually write in this. I find it adorable that they made an acronym for it called WAT, because like, that's you know, from the old WAT days. But uh, you can write straight core WASM. Uh, one of my teammates where I work can write and like, is, is very prolific and very like, uh, just proficient in writing pure WASM. But you don't have to do this. There are lots of things out there that make it possible to go do this. Um, and you can use a lot of languages right now to create WASM targets. And the first and coolest ones, I think, because I've, I've used C for like most of my life, uh, C and C++ has a tool and ecosystem called Inscripten. So Inscripten is something is an LLVM to JavaScript WebAssembly compiler. LLVM sort of sits in between the compilation step and where executable code is created in some ecosystems that are out there. Uh, what this, what Inscripten lets you do is write C code, and then it just spits out the code that you can use that code, those functions, inside JavaScript. Uh, it's kind of cool. You can get really efficient code, and we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, Rust, maybe my second favorite language to R. Um, it's not actually that's not true. It's there. Smalltalk, R, and then, and then Rust. Uh, it, it has LLVM as a background already, or, or as a back end. It's actually a lot easier, I think, to write Rust code that works in WebAssembly than C. Uh, I'm just a little biased because I, I am a pretty big R aficionado, a Rust aficionado. And Go, another language that I use at work, have to, but I also kind of like, um, has experimental support for it as well. And it's still experimental even now, even though it's been around for a while. So lots of modern, cool, useful languages are plugging, plugging themselves into WebAssembly. It's really kind of neat seeing all those things. And there's lots more. So this is a link. The slide links are going to be like, available here. They're also at the end of this. I've already posted it on social media so you can get there. So most of this is a go see other things and learn a bunch of cool stuff talk. Why am I talking about WASM? Why does WebR use WASM? Why? Like, what's up with this whole thing? Um, 
Well, it gives you in browser and on system. We're not going to talk about the on system stuff at all today. You find me after this, I will go on forever about that. Near native execution speed. Why is that important? Well, JavaScript, it's not slow. There's no, I, I don't think you could call JavaScript slow at all in any modern context. But JavaScript isn't as fast as actually running at near native speed. This kind of gets you Wasm almost the speed of running executable code on any endpoint that you're running in a browser. It's not perfect, it's not exactly, but it's really close and a lot closer than native JavaScript. And it's been designed with safety in mind. So if we go back a couple slides, and I made that foofy definition of what this stuff is, it probably sounded to you like, wait a minute, there's this thing running binary blobs of code in a browser context? That sounds an awful lot like Flash. Wasn't Flash a disaster? Yeah, Flash was an absolute disaster. I am sorry if you like playing all those fancy games in Flash that did all sorts of things. It, was a, it brought havoc in, in, from a safety perspective. I do cybersecurity for a living. Um, so I, I'm the guy that makes your days miserable because I always throw, I toss water on all the joy you have online. But um, <laughs> it's back. Flash is back thanks to Wasm. All the Flash games are coming back for me all the flash visual, all the stuff that was made visualization wise. So back in the day, folks may not remember this, but a lot of newspapers and a lot of other online, like, like universities and just online researchers were making amazing, cool, cutting edge visualizations in flash. They all went away because flash went away from every browser. You can't run them. We lost like a decade worth of really cool work. Wasm is bringing that back for us. It's really kind of cool. And so you might have also thought, if you, if you weren't a Flash user, wait a minute, there's this VM running in a browser that runs binary blobs of stuff. Aren't those the, those horrible Java applets? And yeah, it's like those terrible Java applets with the worst user experience in the world. And they're also back too. So for everyone that works in an enterprise, yeah, you're going to have some terrible third party enterprise organization making a Java applet, that re resurrecting it from the zombie grave. And you're going to see that as, I'm sorry, it's not me, it's them. Don't do that. Now, I, and look at nobody wants to add more Java, anybody saying anyway, wants to add more Java code to the universe. So if anything, care about Wasm so we don't have to talk about Java anymore. Um, but this gives us entirely new ways to create um, all sorts of in-browser experiences and applications. And it also lets us do stuff at the edge. It's a fancy term for like running stuff like on the perimeter of the internet. Again, no time to talk about that today. Find me up, and I'll be glad to talk about that in detail. Um, so I'm going to go over here. This is R. Uh, I'm not sure how much you can see. This is actually R running in a Cordo. So you heard about Cordo before. How many people use Cordo? More of you should be raising your hands. Use Cordo. OK, so this is using uh, in Cordo. Uh, this is an R environment. This is an actual R thing. And I'm going to prove it to you. This, the demo gods be with me. I just ran R code in the browser. You can see what the session information is, Wasm32, blah, 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 blah. Um, so you don't, and I could have make, made, made that up. So I'm going to paste what I had on my clipboard. And I didn't, I pasted too long in the clipboard. So let me do that and do it again. That, I just proved that it's actually running something. So I just ran some really old, tired, not tidy models, you know, like a, sorry, sorry but like old school R. Um, stuff into our in browser, not not no shiny server required, no magic, no sending it to an API anywhere. All running here. If I if I turn the internet off, turn the network off, it would still run. It's kind of amazing. So why is that amazing? So it works on Chromebooks. Horrible. I hate Chromebooks. It runs on those icky Windows systems, Jared too. Uh, it doesn't require a shiny server. If you know me, you know that's to me a really good thing. Uh, it provides a robust graphics device because ARP has that cool graphics device ca capability. There's a great graphics device for it now that's been built by the creators, who we'll talk about in a second, which means I get to put G ggplot2 in the browser without having to write, you know, have them execute code somewhere else. It's modern R. It's based on R4.1, and it will continue to work with R moving forward. You're not just use, executing those chunky code blocks like I showed. I'll talk about it in a second. It's all in browser. And you could even, if you like Jupyter Notebooks, I'm not one of the, like I'm on the left side of that, do you hate Jupyter Notebooks or like them? I am on the hate, despise, should never exist Jupyter Notebooks side. Um, but more exciting for me than that than anything is, I like to do stats and all that kind of work in R, and now I get to do that in R and give JavaScript the results. This is great, it makes a whole new generation of web apps possible, and I'm really excited about it. So like I said, everything has an origin, every good superhero has a great origin story. Uh, so this one is George Stagg and Lionel Henry. You might know Lionel from RStudio. George is also RStudio. I'm sorry, Posit. I still can't do that. It's Posit now. 
Uh, just clarification on here. So like, I did not ask them if I could run their, uh, image, their images through some fancy AI thing online that's going to steal their image and give me a cartoon back. So this is a 15-year-old image magic script that did a pretty decent job with no AI involved. So I just wanted to give a shout out to image magic. It's pretty cool. Um, so you might have seen that WebR came out this year. Around March, 0.1.0 was published, but that is not the origin of WebR. The origin of WebR goes way back to 2022, when if you were stalking George like I was, you saw him in his own repo, not this one, uh, create something like called WebR. I'm like, what's going on here? I want to see this. So four directories, seven files. He managed to work a miracle. He actually got R ported over to Wasm, so it was runnable in that context. Now, you're saying, wait a minute, you just told me all this stuff was like the C, and there isn't RC, like you just recompile it, it should just work. And you're right. So I stole this from George's presentation. You should just be able to take those C files, put them through a configure statement, get the stuff out, and boom, you're available. You know, it's all done, make a lot of money, go on vacation, drink a lot of beers, it's great. This, this is what it should be like. And, but you know, I think everybody that knows, that uses R might know this, but we use a lot of Fortran when we use R. And that means like Blast and LaPack and lots of other things that are out there. Also, a lot of packages are compiled packages that are based on C or C++ or even out Golang or Fortran or Rust. R is probably the best language for wrapping something, some other language's binary code into it to be able to use it. I say that having used lots of things over the course of my very long lifetime, and I'm a little biased about how awesome R is in this particular case. But because of this complexity, it's really frustrating. It's just a royal pain. It's, it's actually a maze of twisty little pass passages for everyone that used to play Zork as a kid or as an adult. Um, it takes a lot of effort to get R working in a WASM context. It's just, it is phenomenal. And between George and Lionel and a bunch of other people that have contributed to it, who have literally pulled their hair out at times to try to make this work and get it working in this environment, um, they've managed to do it in a repeatable way. Um, this is really exciting. They have done so much hard work, and we have so much to be thankful for, specifically George, but George and Lionel now. Um, we owe, I, I owe them personally a debt of gratitude, but I think we all do as well. So we have all this power now. We have R anywhere without a server. What are you going to do with this power? I am not going to repeat the tagline that you've heard way too many times in every, uh, every Spider-Man origin story movie ever made by Marvel. Uh, so you have great power. This is how easy it is to use this great power. So um, this, is a, this is a JavaScript file. And what I'm doing in this JavaScript file, it's not super important to go through it in a lot of detail, but that import line is basically what you would type. Maybe there'd be a URL instead of just like rwasm. That gives you all of web R. And those next couple lines make R available every single place in JavaScript in your HTML file. That is all you have to do to start using web R. Now, I've done some fun stuff with that. Um, I've made a bunch of, I've been playing with WebR for a while now. So I've got some helper functions. But in this particular one, hopefully anyone here can read the R cut on this one, which is I'm basically just making a date sequence. That's all I'm doing here in R. So that's going to create a, character, a, a date vector in R. Then it's going to turn into a character vector. By just using that R code with that little R and that, you know, the, the, the brackets thing, I have now made all of that R data available to JavaScript. And that console log is basically going to print out the JavaScript array from the R character vector. And this is a toy example, but this is literally all you have to do to make stuff available from R to JavaScript. So you can run all sorts of fancy, cool statistical stuff on there. You can run machine learning stuff on there. You can do amazing stuff with R, feed it all back to JavaScript so we could do other things with it to present it to the user. And I'm going to show you some of those later. But this is literally how simple it is. But if that's still too complex for you, uh, James Balamute, uh, Coatless on Twitter and everywhere else, Coatless professor, one of the coolest humans. If you ever get a chance to meet James, it's one of the coolest humans on the planet. He actually made it even simpler. So that little demo that I showed you before was actually his Cordo version of WebR. So he basically made it so you do this. Uh, there's a little button right here. I can do this. Yeah, you, made it, you do this little WebR chunk, and it fires up the web R instantiates it, does all the work I just showed you how to do in the JavaScript, and you get to do anything with that in there. And I was able to type in that code block, but you could have it run the stuff, make ggplots, throw HTML widgets up, whatever you want to go do. And he's made it super easy to start working in Cordo and web R. So if you weren't, if you weren't a believer in Cordo before, you really should be now, because it's going to make your life a lot easier when you build some things. 
Um, and there are now about 200 pre-built WebR packages, which is double from what it was when it first came out. And most of you that, because I, I, I will ask, someone here has to know the answer because there's got to be CRAN aficionados here. How many packages does CRAN have? Somebody? Come on, somebody. John, I'm going to big like you if you know him. Yeah, so yeah, there's like 18 or 19,000 packages, uh, nearly 20,000 on CRAN. 200 is a really, really small thing. So like I mentioned before, a lot of those are like compiled packages. It's really rough to do that still. So we're in a nascent stage, but the tidyverse is available. So for everyone that wants to do tidyverse in there, ggplot's available. A bunch of really cool things and useful things are there. I've been following what they're porting over to there. Tidy models is there now. We're going to be there soon. Um, so things that you're familiar with in modern R are actually there now. Um, R, how many people are familiar with R universe? Ooh, so definitely click that link when you get there later because I can't talk about it. Uh, R OpenSci and Yarun have made this amazing thing, which is not CRAN. I kind of don't take this bad CRAN, folks. I kind of want CRAN to die in a fire. Um, uh, but there's reasons. Talk to me later. I'd be glad to opine about it. Um, our universe is like going to be the new CRAN. It's, the, it's amazing. Uh, they're going to pre-build WASM packages as well too for us, so we don't have to deal with a lot of these things. But what the cool thing is, even though they haven't, even though they haven't made or compiled a bunch of even base R packages for it, any base R package right now can be used in Web R. And I've got stuff online that show you how to do that. So there's a lot of just pure base R packages, even with dependencies out there. So they're all available right now. So it goes beyond those 200. So this is what you can do with it. You have all this power, but you're going to use this power in a new way. You're going to use this power in the web. Uh, so I'm going to purport that, but I'd like a show of hands as I read through these. How many people know Markdown in some form? Figured, cool. How many people know HTML, CSS, some way, shape, or form? Very cool. And at least a little JavaScript? Cool, because most of us have cut and pasted script tags from Stack Overflow to try to make something work in something that we couldn't do before. This is great. You're all set up to use WebR. I'm really serious about this. Um, so you have great power at your fingertips, and you're going to hate this. I hate this. The browser is the future of data science. I'm really sorry. I mean, I know it's not for large language models because they need uh, large amounts of like um, uh, environment killing compute to be able to do what they do. But the browser is going to be where most of us do our work moving forward, and where a lot of the people that we need to teach for the next generation and what they have is going to do that too. So you can't let this power be co-opted by people that say, you should use Vue.js, or you should use like any one of the cool frameworks out there, or you should just build stuff in X. When someone tells you to do it this way, now that you have freedom, it at the very least constrains you. And if you've seen the movie that I've been basing this on, it doesn't go well um, if they tell you what to do because you end up having to fight a bunch of things at the end, and it just it's, it's a bad day. It's really a bad day. So I'm, gonna, so I'm challenging everyone here. Learn HTML, CSS, JS more than you have now. This is a great place to start. Links everywhere on the slides to go forward. Um, Mozilla Developer Network, their guides are amazing. You should go there for that as well, as is W3 Schools. Great places to just keep in your browser tabs. There, they'll be indispensable references and teach you everything you need to know. Learn modern tooling. Uh, so I talked about I, I, Glitch is a cool modern environment. Talk to me later about why it is. Basically, it doesn't touch a server at all. It runs everything in the browser, the entire JS development, all in browser, no JS, web server, everything. REPL, it's getting close to that too, both great environments. I'm going to tell you to use something like VS Code or one of the non-skeezy versions of it. But if you like NeoVim or Sublime Text or some newer ones, they're also kind of getting up to par on some of these things. Uh, so I'd like you to hit up the mothership with a minute and 38 seconds left. Uh, mothership is WebR. I will try to make it a little bigger for you. Go there for everything. It's now at 0.1.2. It was 0.1 before. It's kind of cool. Um, this is also their, their, this is their version of the R console that's running inside there. So you can actually play with R and a graphics environment right there. Um, check out my web R experiments. So I've been going crazy about this thing. So for a while this year, I just did a lot of things to give people a lot of ways to go do this kind of stuff. One is I built an entire online IDE that's very VS Code-esque or RStudio-esque. If you, if you use RStudio, it's got all the kind of bells and whistles there, online help and everything. It looks a lot more like you would use RStudio than it would be for that other one that's out there. Um, I also have an example of showing how to use this. How many people have heard of Observable? Uh, it's, like D it's, cool. it's like D3. They have a plot library that's also not associated with Observable directly. This is R feeding random sample data to D3 um, plot libraries out there, dynamically updating charts within there, R, do R doing all the work for the data, JS doing all the work for the visualizations. Lots of really cool things that you can do out there with this that you just could not do before in an easy way. The 
start with Cordo. Uh, basically, like I, it's knitting a Cordo document with R code in it. Everyone here can do that. Monitor the WebR topic that's on GitHub or any one of your other favorite social coding sites. I also have links to all these in here. There's already an, there's an awesome list for everything. There's an awesome list for WebR, too. Um, please make stuff with WebR, because like, this isn't hubris, but like, I'm the only one building stuff with WebR, it seems. So like, I'm kind of in there a lot. So I need company, so please, please go. I don't run the list, but it's just there. Watch what our universe is doing, because you're going to find all the packages there. Um, look at, so I have to say something else about Python in a couple seconds. I, oh, I'm done. But Pyodide is Python beat us there. Let's beat them. Rust is there. Go is there. And there's all sorts of other things that you can do. Please hit this up, because there's lots of great resource. Um, you are going to make WebR successful. Go build things. And this is where you can find me to learn more about this. I'll be back out there to talk to people about this. I will talk you off about WebR, though. So thank you. <laughs>